So we're gonna give these guys a tour and uh, yeah, just have a little bit of a research and coaching conversation. We're really interested in uh, the drivers of human performance, both on the team sport level, which is what my focus has been on as far as athlete monitoring goes, but really wanting to shift into strength, the strength world and you know, getting into uh, what are the drivers of strength? What are the key metrics that we can be monitoring for our strength athletes? So Mike, I'd love to get your take on that because I know your philosophy is if you think of traditional periodization as top down, I know that you've had some great success with more of this emerging training yeah. philosophy. Yeah, so um, basically the catalyst for me was uh, through applying traditional planning models. Uh, we noticed that things that should work sometimes don't. And uh, me coaching a bunch of individuals, I want each individual to maximize their potential. That bothered me tremendously. <laughs> and uh, uh, eventually I came across a method of planning training used by Dr. Anatoly Bondarchuk, uh, who was a, uh, a very famous uh, hammer throw coach, shot mm -hmm. coach. Um, I borrowed a lot of those ideas, translated them into what it would be for, like for powerlifting, and it's a bottom-up planning structure. It's, there's nothing is all top-down or all bottom-up, so there's elements of both, but the idea is that instead of uh, starting with the big picture in mind and breaking it into uh, certain block lengths and each block length potentiating the next. Instead of doing it that way, we will let the athlete's response dictate basically everything about the program. Uh, how long should the block be? Well, that depends on how long the athlete's responding to it. What exercises should we do? What intensities should we do? Which volumes uh, and so on. Basically any variable that you think is important we can track it and optimize it to what is that individual most responsive to. And we've found some really interesting things. Uh, I've written programs for people that were effective that I would never would have come up with otherwise. Uh, which to me, uh, you know, if I write a program and I look at it on paper and I go, I don't know about this, but it works. That highlights a process that's that's doing something, it's not just me. It's not just me thinking about training and coming up with some harebrained scheme. Um, it's important to point out that by and large, for most people, we end up coming up with something that's around the average, which is what you would expect, right? That right. most people respond in a fairly typical way, but nobody's average on everything. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about really dialing it in as well as we can, uh, then we wanna get all those details right. So uh, I think that's kind of the philosophy that's at the core of how we develop training. Yeah, that's awesome. It almost sounds like if you think about the scientific training principles like specificity, overload, et cetera, and, and that one individualization, right, which I know a lot of people put that more towards the back end of importance, like that's ranked lower. And so much of training would be similar across individuals. It almost sounds like you're bumping that up several notches and say, well, hold on, we know that even, even things like overload is highly individualized. And so keeping that a key focus, seeing everything through that lens. Um, yeah, to me, individualization as a principle just kind of permeates through all of it. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, the, take the principle of overload, you have to apply an overload stimulus to get the adaptation, but how, what kind of overload, uh, to what extent should that overload be applied? Well, that varies from person to person. And specificity even, I think we could talk at length about what specificity is mm -hmm. because I think in general we imagine specificity to be uh, things that look vaguely like the competition exercise right. and there's layers to it. Layers. And uh, something can be way more specific at one level but less specific at a different level and how does that balance mm -hmm. out? What we really care about is transfer. Mm. And then if you start to, especially with a sport like powerlifting, transfer is measurable. Uh, we can do a thing and then see if it actually improved your performance right. in a fairly direct way. Uh, so we can start to measure transfer and that's 
more important, really. Yeah, and, and I seem to remember um, if memory serves in, in Bondarchuk's uh, training uh, paradigm, those, mm -hmm. is it those special exercises, the, the high transfer exercises that he has his athletes yeah. do. But like you said, it's specificity is not just biomechanical specificity, right. not just does it look like the thing that you're doing. Otherwise, we'd have soccer athletes in here kicking a weighted soccer ball around. Right. We need to think about not only the biomechanics of it, but also what's the hormonal response, what's the time under tension in comparison, what muscle groups are being activated, and in what order or what sequence. Um, I mean, even structurally, like at the tissue level, something might be highly specific because it enforces and makes that tissue more robust in mm -hmm. order to handle the competition lift for a power lifter. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So um, I want to hear more about the outputs, some of those outputs that you measure, because I think that's maybe where some of this overlap can happen between yeah. the questions that you're asking as a coach and what research could potentially provide as far as what we can measure and track over time. Yeah, I think at the, at the basic level, we always have to keep the goal to goal. So for powerlifting, we always need to monitor 1RM strength in the squat, bench press, mm -hmm. and deadlift. Mm -hmm. And after that, there's other things that can be interesting and trends that we might notice, but uh, we always want to come back to that. Uh, so for me, primarily, when we're running a, a normal development block, we're going to be monitoring the estimated 1RM in each of those competition sessions uh, and monitoring that performance. Hopefully we see an upward trend. If you notice a downward trend or uh, something that's not going quite right, you can intervene. Uh, with that said, as we've continued to develop, uh, once we, we call it our, our tier one block, uh, the block that's the final block leading into a competition. Once you have that established, you start to uh, broaden your scope. That's kind of where the name Emerging Strategies comes from. The long-term plan emerges from short-term responses. Mm. So first you really nail down this tier one block. Then you broaden the scope a bit. Uh, what blocks can we do leading into that tier one block to enhance our response? Mm. Sometimes that's, it's always important to keep the estimated 1RM in mind, but I've noticed that there are times when uh, we may do a block that we don't necessarily expect to really drive the 1RM up. We expect it to maybe improve your rep capacity or right. something like that. And that that could lead to better than expected performances when we get to the tier one block. The future blocks. Yeah, so, yeah I, I would imagine uh, something like a hypertrophy block or somebody yeah. going up a weight class, somebody yeah. coming back from some time off. Are those some of the situations where you might see that? Sure, but even I think in a, in a normal training environment, you can't just hammer the same stimulus over and over. Uh, I would say that's, if there's a place where I've gone wrong in some of the coaching that I've done, it's writing training that's too similar. Mm -hmm. So you find the thing that works and you just keep doing that over and over. Yeah. Well, after a few blocks, you're not really responding as well to that as you might. Uh, and there's other things that you can do that are engaging to the athlete uh, which is a big thing, is uh, undervalued, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and possibly potentiating mm -hmm. uh, in a physiological way. Um, it's at least it's at least not off the table right. that that could be the case, and it seems to make the future blocks go better, which is the idea. It sounds like, I, I mean, it sounds like to me that tier one block mm -hmm. is when you figure out that 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 mesocycle, that type of mesocycle leads to the biggest improvements, maybe the questions we should be asking are, well, what were the adaptations? What were the specific measurable adaptations yeah. that did drive that 1RM up? Because, you know, as a coach, you can be measuring um, the performance outcomes with estimated 1RMs frequently, sure. but, but maybe the coach doesn't have the capacity to do things like, well, what was, what was the change in muscle architecture? What was the change in, yeah. in you know, thigh girth or something? What, what does the... Uh, what, what does the athlete's force time curve look like in that squat? Like, it's pretty easy yeah. to measure velocity, um, and then you can kind of infer power from that. Um, did their technique change? Uh, more than maybe at finer gradations than what you can see with your eye. And so yeah. maybe that's, that's where these research tools can come in, and we can start looking at those changes, and do they change in accordance with changes in strength? Yeah, that makes sense to me.
I think that would be a, a really good way uh, to look at it. Uh, and you might find, I, I think you will find that people are going to surprise you. That there's the thing that we imagine would happen if we're kind of looking at training in a box. That uh, the, the final block should be the highest intensity block to really work on the integration between strength and technique and all these things. But in practice, we find that some people don't respond well to that. Uh, maybe they get beat up and kind of have pain issues. Uh, or maybe they just don't seem to get stronger from that, but they do seem to get stronger from, like I, I had one guy who really responded well to like this middle rep range, like six reps around eight RPE. Uh, and if we pushed very much heavier than that, uh, our response diminished. Mm. So we just did that going into competition. Now, you would imagine that there's a physiologically different adaptation to that versus multiple singles or right. uh, very high rep sets or something like that. Mm -hmm. So what is it and, and why maybe does that athlete respond better to that in this moment? And might it be different a year from now? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, well, let's, I think it'd be cool. Let's go take a look at the lab yeah. and see some of the tools that we have to measure these things. I'd love to, yeah, just keep sort of uh, coming up with some ideas for how, how can we measure some of these uh, training adaptations yeah. as, as the mesocycle as the cycle goes on. And, that, and that's what's interesting too, is because usually, you know, in most situations, you only have one, maybe two very elite individuals um, in a research study. The cool thing about the team that we're developing here and, and some of these people like Mike T, Garrett Blevins uh, that we have is we can, we can expand our network of very, very strong people and get them in, study them more frequently. So now instead of, uh, you know, instead of a one-off, instead of like a small pilot study or a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, case study. Thank you, person off screen. Instead of, <laughs> instead of a case study, we can put together an actual training cohort and study them uh, as they approach a meet. So let's go to the lab. All right, so here we are. This is, this is part of our lab equipment. So we have two campuses at Loma, we, and we divide our equipment between this uh, lab and our lab on the main campus as well. Um, in here right now, we have some of our force platforms. We see there's uh, an isometric mid-thigh pole station set up right there. We can also take those force plates out though. Uh, primarily, we use them for jump testing and reactive type testing. So a neuromuscular readiness test for our athletes. Um, and then also strength and conditioning testing, just you know, looking at force time curves and the differences between different exercises. We do a lot of that type of stuff with our grad students because it illustrates a lot of the biomechanical principles and, and can really show us like, hey, here, here's why something like a back squat might be more effective than a goblet squat for certain um, outcomes. Let's look at the forces generated and let's compare those to the forces generated maybe in a rugby scrum or when you're jumping. Okay. Um, we also have uh, over here, this is a leg press machine that is, uh, it has eccentric accentuated training modules built into it as well as accommodating resistance. Um, the only other one I think in use is with NASA right now. So that's pretty cool, but we're running a study on that. The really cool thing about this is even though it's a leg press, it's not a back squat you know, with weight releasers, so the ecological validity isn't quite the same. We can fine tune the protocol and really, really control it. We of course have metabolic carts. Um, we just have one here, uh, as well as body composition station, muscle architecture, ultrasound stuff. And then a lot of our other equipment right now, actually we just brought it to the main campus yesterday because we have our athletes coming in and we're gonna do the preseason testing. Um, so yeah, Mike, I'd be interested to know, like, you know, as, as you're thinking through equipment, you're thinking about things like force platforms, um, maybe even work capacity, like VO2 max stuff, body composition changes, um, the implementation of AEL training or, or um, variable resistance training. As a coach, uh, what questions are you asking? Where is your mind going with that? Well, the this is a great example, the, the leg press that gives you a lot of options for how you want the loading to, to be conducted. So I was just talking with someone yesterday about how I've experimented a lot with weight releasers in my mm -hmm. training. It's an idea that is interesting 
and then I'll give it a go in a development block and it just never seems to work. But uh, like moth to a flame, I keep coming back every six months or so, I gotta try it again. Yeah. And I wonder why does it not seem to pan out? And one of the things would be maybe it's just not enough. Maybe the stimulus isn't strong enough because with the weight releaser, it's one repetition. Single rep, you gotta reload. Yeah. So you're not getting that much. So maybe something like this could show like, oh, well actually if you uh, had a higher volume of this in the training that that might be uh, a direction that's worth exploring. Uh, or it might show, no, nah, that's not gonna, that's not a rabbit hole worth going down. Right, and maybe it's no better than the same equivalent volume on a standard lift. Sure. Yeah, yeah, interesting. It does, it, it is, we'll have to get you on there and do a protocol, because you sure. can do, you know, sets of 10 where <laughs> uh, the eccentric is 120% of whatever you tested on there as your max. Okay. Um, so we haven't maxed it out yet. I don't know what it maxes out at, but I think the two of probably, you. Probably <laughs> more than I can. Between one of you, you could do it. <laughs> I just think it's so interesting um, when we start combining research. You, you've been in the lab, and sometimes we've seen studies which are a little bit you know, disjointed from actual coaching practice. But the receptivity for this program um, to be interested in what actual boots on the ground coaches are thinking about and to mold those two things together to break away from some of the very top-down focused philosophies and bring in some bottom-up and see what we're going to learn and what we're going to find out and just be excited about the things that we're discovering that we didn't expect to find already. So it's a very cool project. Yeah, yeah. and that's a good point too because I think in the team sport environment actually that's where a lot of, we do have very agile programming because you think about, yeah. you know, you think about a long baseball season or something, yeah. you cannot expect everybody to adapt the same way to that training program, plus with all the games that they have and the unexpected, um, you know, and, and sort of disjointed ability to train. Some, some weeks the strength coach might get two days with him. Some yeah. weeks there's, you know, no time in the weight room. And so to be able to, track some markers that we know in team sports um, can show us their readiness uh, but I don't I don't know if that work is being done yet or it's just starting to be done in more of that strength uh, side of things for power lifters or strong man or weightlifting. Well something I've heard you talk about already uh, that will speak to a lot of this is uh, studying things like fatigue and readiness and I kind of have talked a little bit before about um, went through like this year-long thing where I was really obsessed with fatigue and trying to figure out you know it seemed more important than what a lot of people were giving it credit for being but I couldn't quite put my finger on why mm -hmm. and it, long story short after a lot of thinking came to a conclusion that probably isn't surprising to you there's fatigue means a lot of different things Yes. And it depends on what we're talking about exactly, whether it's important or not important, or uh, it, is it maybe part of the intent of the training, or is it just along for the ride? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it depends on, we have to be more detailed with it. Yeah, yeah, so if we can, br if we can break fatigue down into the component pieces. Yeah. So there's psychological fatigue, and there's physiological fatigue, and, and both of those have different components as well. You know, and then they are intertwined. They're entangled, and then that's the hard part. Is, yeah. is yeah, you can't get you can't get central without peripheral fatigue. You know, sure, you're going to have different metabolic fatigue training for a marathon than you are training for one rep max in yeah. squat. Mm -hmm. And but it's all fatigue. But as you're saying, you've got to break that out. And mm -hmm. studying that with advanced athletes, not just you know three to six months training experience, right. a cohort maybe of ten to twelve people. Definitely, you can get information from that, but mm -hmm. if you can bring the best mm -hmm. and you bring advanced people and you look at different stages in their development, what's appropriate, yeah. uh, there's just so much work left to be done. Yeah, and it's a long-term process, too. I think, uh, you know, similar to like, you know, both of you very strong gentlemen, your careers in powerlifting, think of how, how many years it's taken you to learn some of the lessons that you can now freely espouse on camera, sure. you know, and, and yeah. other people can benefit from that. Research is, is much the same. We start, you know, we start with this big idea of everything that we want to know, and then we take, we tackle little bite-sized chunks yeah. at a time, and they build upon each other, and, and there's, it's surprising. I mean, and that's the whole draw of it, right? Yeah, of course. You should go in with your hypothesis and be ready to be surprised. Yeah, 
I think that's the excitement that's drawn us all to this this project and to this field, and that's what we love, discovering yeah. new things. Got to try to figure it out. That's right. Yeah, we'll do it together. Inspiration brings us closer to greatness. It provides us with the strength we need to evolve. Evolve AI is built for one thing, your evolution. Our AI-powered app customizes and adjusts your workout based on fitness level, fatigue, and feedback, so you can optimize your training and generate results faster. Our innovative training system is backed by research, designed by industry-leading coaches, tested by world-class athletes, and supercharged by artificial intelligence. Greatness lives inside all of us, no matter who we are or where we come from. All it takes is the inspiration to find it. Unlock your potential. Evolve AI.